Welcome to Fairy Tale Fritz. If you enjoy fairy tales and bedtime stories, please hit the subscribe button in the bottom right corner and you will receive updates and more tales. Dwarf Knows Part 2 As Jacob the dwarf passed through the gates of the palace, the doorkeeper asked what he wanted. Jacob said he was a cook and that he wished to see the chief steward. When he was taken to the steward's office, the man seized him up from head to toe and said, You want to be a cook? Whoever sent you to me has been making a fool of you. But the dwarf would not be disheartened. What do you have to lose? said he. An egg or two, a little bit of syrup and wine, some flour, some spices. In a house like yours, where the supplies are plentiful, task me to prepare a delicious meal. Any meal you like. Provide me with the ingredients I need. And you'll be saying, this is a cook indeed, no doubt. The dwarf went on in a similar fashion, and there was something mesmerizing about him, the vigor flashing in his little eyes, the way he gesticulated with his long, thin fingers. All right, said the steward. I will take you to the kitchen, just for fun. The kitchen was large, roomy, and well-stocked. Fires were burning on twenty hearths, and kitchen utensils of all sorts lay about, alongside kettles and pans and spoons and forks. When the steward entered, all workers paused, and the only sound heard was the crackling of the fires. What has the Grand Duke ordered for his breakfast today? asked the steward of an older cook who held the position of head of the breakfast department. Danish soup and red hobbard dumpling. Good, said the steward to Jacob. Do you think you could prepare this difficult meal? Nothing easier, answered the dwarf. For the soup, I shall want the fat of a wild swan, turnips, and eggs. For the dumpling, however, I shall want four different kinds of meat, some Madeira wine, goose grease, ginger, and some mixed herbs and marjoram. What magician has taught you? cried the cook with astonishment. We have never even heard of that herb. It must make the dish a lot nicer. Let's put him to the test, said the steward. Give him the things that he requires. This they did, and arranged everything on the stove, but found that the dwarf was too short to reach them. So they put two stools on top of each other, and laid thereon a marble slab, and invited the little curiosity to begin his cooking. When he had got everything ready, he asked them to put both pots on the fire and let them simmer for a certain time. Then he called out, Stop! The pots were set aside, and the dwarf invited the steward to come and taste the contents. The great man marched with dignity to the hearth, tasted, smacked his lips and said, Excellent, excellent upon my soul. And the head cook shook the dwarf heartily by the hand and said, You are a veritable master in the art. That herb gives it quite a special flavor. Just then, a footman came to say that the duke was waiting for his breakfast. The food was put on silver dishes and sent to table. The steward, however, took the dwarf into his room and entertained him there. They had not been together long before a messenger came to say that the steward was to go at once to the duke. The Grand Duke looked very pleased and stroked his beard. Well, steward, said he, who cooked my breakfast today? It has never been so good since I came into my kingdom. Tell me the name of the cook. We will send him a little present. My lord duke, it is quite a story, said the steward, and told him all that had happened. The grand duke sent for the dwarf, and asked him who he was and where he came from. The dwarf answered briefly that he had no parents and had been taught cooking by an old woman. 
If you can stay with me, I will give you every year 50 ducats and a handsome suit of clothes. In return for this, you must cook me breakfast every day yourself and keep my kitchen clean. You shall be called Long Nose and wear the uniform of your deputy steward. Long Nose fell on his knees before the Duke and kissed his feet and promised to serve him faithfully. The dwarf well fulfilled his duties before he came. The Grand Duke hath been sometimes inclined to throw the plates and dishes at the cook's head, but since the dwarf had been in the house, everything soon changed. Instead of three meals a day, the Duke ate five and found everything delicious. He was always good-tempered and got stouter every day. The dwarf was the wonder of the town. People begged for permission to see him at work, and some of the best families obtained leave from the duke for their servants to take lessons from him, and he earned no small amount of money this way. He gave all this, however, to the other cooks, so that they should not be jealous of him. So Long Nose lived respected and prosperous, only troubled by the thoughts of his parents' grief. But at the end of his second year's service, he had a great stroke of luck. As often as he could find time, Longnose went to the marketplace to buy poultry and fruit. One day, at the end of the stalls, he saw a woman sitting by a large coop of geese. He went up to her and examined the birds. They seemed satisfactory, and so he bought three. However, he noticed with some surprise that, while two of the geese gobbled and grunted, the third one was quiet and moppish, and sighed heavily, just like a human being. Mm, it is ill, said he. I must make haste and cure it. But the goose suddenly said, Treat me well, I'll be your friend. Treat me ill, your life shall end. Longnose was so startled that he dropped the coop, and the goose looked at him with soft, sad eyes, and it sighed. Why, you can speak, cried Jacob. I did not expect this. Do not be so unhappy. I will do all I can to help you. You certainly were not born with feathers on your back. That is true, said the goose. I was not born in this terrible form. But while I was in my cradle, it was prophesied that I should end my life in the kitchen of a grand duke. Do not be alarmed, you poor thing, said the dwarf. Nothing shall happen to you. I will take your coop to my own room, and I will tell the steward that I am feeding up a goose on special green stuff for the grand duke's table, and at the first opportunity, I will set you free. The dwarf did all that he had promised. He built up a little cage for the enchanted bird in his own room, saying he wanted to fatten it up on a special diet as a surprise for his master. And as often as he had time, he used to go and chat with her. She told him all her history, and Long Nose learned that the goose was called Mimi, and was the daughter of Wetterbach the magician, who lived on the island of Gotland. He had quarreled with an old fairy who had revenged herself by turning his daughter into a swan and bringing her to market. When Longnose has listened to her story, she said, What you have told me about herb magic and your own transfiguration after smelling a herb convinces me that you have been bewitched by the perfume of these herbs and that if you could find the plant used by the old fairy, you maybe could regain your own appearance. Just at this time, a very powerful prince visited the Grand Duke, who sent for Longnose and said, This is an excellent opportunity for you to show what a masterful cook you are. The prince who is coming to stay with me is a connoisseur in food and a very wise man. Never serve the same dish twice. You can ask my treasurer for anything you want. I would rather become poor than blush for my table. The little dwarf put all his skill forward. 
All day long he was to be seen in clouds of smoke from roasting fires, and his words of command were to be heard all through the kitchen. The traveling prince had been a fortnight at the castle and was well flattered. There were always five meals a day, and the Grand Duke was delighted with his cook's skill when he saw how his guest enjoyed himself. On the fifteenth day, the Grand Duke sent for the dwarf and presented him to the prince, asking if he was satisfied with his cooking. You certainly know what is good to eat, said the prince to Longnose. You have never repeated a dish all the time I have been here, and everything is splendidly served. But why aren't you sending us a suzerain pastry? It is the queen of all dishes. Longnose had never heard of this queen of pastries, but he answered readily enough. My lord, I hoped your gracious visit to this course would be a long one, and I was waiting to offer this delicacy on the day of your departure. Why have you never prepared this pastry for me? cried the Grand Duke. Think of another parting dish and let us have the pastry tomorrow. It shall be as my lord wishes, replied the dwarf. And he went out, feeling as if his luck was over, for he had not the least idea how to make the pastry, and he went to his room and wept. The goose Mimi asked what troubled him. Dry your tears, she said, and then she told him, We often had that pastry at my father's table. I know exactly how it is made and what you require for it, and if some little thing is left out, no one will be much the wiser. Longnose had blessed the day when he bought this little goose, and immediately he set to work to make this queen of pastries according to her instructions. He first made a small one, and it tasted delicious, and the steward again praised his ability. The next day he sent the pastry to table, hot from the oven, and decorated with a wreath of flowers. Then he put on his best suit and went to the dining hall. As he entered, the court carver had just served both the prince and grand duke with their portions on magnificent silver plates. The grand duke ate a mouthful, looked at his plate, and said, Truly this is the queen of pastries. And my dwarf is the king of cooks, is he not, my friend? The guest took a bite and chewed and tasted, laughing to himself. The thing is good enough, said he, as he pushed his blade away. But the suzerain, it certainly is not. I can answer for that. The Grand Duke frowned with anger and cried, Dog of a dwarf! How dare you trifle with your lord! Heaven knows, my lord, I have made the pastry according to the best recipe. It must be right. Tremblingly answered the dwarf. It is a lie, you rascal, shouted the Grand Duke. My guest would not otherwise have found fault. I will have you chopped up and made into a pastry. Have pity, said the dwarf, throwing himself on his knees before the prince. Tell me what it is lacking. Do not let me die for a handful of flour and a little bit of meat. That would not serve any purpose, dear long nose, answered the prince, smiling. This pastry lacks a herb which no one about here knows. It is the herb borage, a notable relish, and without it the pastry has no true flavor and neither your master nor I care to eat it. Then the Grand Duke stormed and raged. By my soul, he cried, if you do not bring me the exact pastry tomorrow, your head shall be cut off and fastened on the gate of my palace. Go, you little wretch. I will give you just twenty-four hours' grace. The dwarf went weeping from the hall and told the goose of his fate, and that he must die because he had never heard of this herb. Tell me, my friend, are there any old chestnut trees near the castle? asked the goose. Yes, answered Longnose. By the lake there is a large group, but why do you ask? Well, at the foot of the old chestnut trees this herb grows, said Mimi. So take me under your arm and put me down by the trees, 
and I will find it for you. He took her up and went to the door, but a guard had been placed there and said, I have orders that you are not to go out of the house. But I must go to the garden, said Long Nose. Send one of your fellows to the officer of the palace and ask if I may go into the garden to look for herbs. The guard did so, and the dwarf received permission to go into the garden. The goose wandered around and round the chestnut trees, but could not find the herb, and she cried with disappointment and sympathy. But the dwarf, who was also looking about, suddenly noticed some trees the other side of the lake, and he cried, Over there! There is a large old tree. Perhaps we shall be fortunate. The goose flew along, and he ran after her as quickly as his little legs could carry him. The chestnut tree threw a deep shadow, and it was so dark beneath its branches that it was difficult to see anything. But the goose suddenly stood still, flapped her wings with joy, and poked her bill into the long grass and pulled something out, which she handed to the astonished dwarf. And she said, This is the herb, and here is a large patch of it, so you need never be without it again. The dwarf looked thoughtfully at the herb. Its sweet scent reminded him of the day when he was bewitched. The stalks and leaves were bluish green, and it had a bright red flower with golden stamen. How wonderful! I believe this is the very same herb which changed me from a squirrel to a dreadful little dwarf. Shall I taste a bit? Not now, said the goose. Bring a handful with you and let us go back to your room and collect all your things together, and then you shall see what the herb will do. They went back to his room, and the dwarf's heartbeat was fast with excitement. After he had made a bundle of his clothes and safely concealed his money, about fifty ducats, he said, Surely God has willed that I shall end this unhappy condition. And he pushed his nose down in the bunch of herbs and inhaled the scent. Then his whole body seemed to stir. He felt as if he had his own head on his shoulders. He looked at his nose in the glass, and it was getting smaller and smaller. His chest and back straightened out, and his legs grew longer. The goose was greatly astonished. Oh, how you are growing! How tall you are! Thank God that nothing worse has happened to you. Now you are yourself again. Jacob was indeed happy, and he folded his hands and said a short prayer. But in his joy, he did not forget his gratitude to the goose Mimi, and though he longed to go at once to his parents, he felt he must defer this pleasure for her sake. And he said, To whom do I owe this happiness but to you? Without you, I should never have found that herb, and must always have remained a dwarf, or have been hanged by the Grand Duke. So first of all, I must consider you. I will take you to your father, and he being so clever in magic will easily remove the spell from you. The goose shed tears of joy, and they took their departure. Jacob got safely and unrecognized out of the palace and made his way as quickly as possible to the seashore where Mimi's home was. There is little more to tell, except that they happily reached their journey's end and that Wetterbach was able to turn his daughter back into her former state, and that Jacob, laden with presents, made his way home. His parents welcomed him joyfully, and with the money Wetterbach had given him, he bought himself a shop and became rich and prosperous. Oh, one more thing. After he had left the palace, things were rather unsettled. For the next day, when the dwarf did not bring the pastry as he promised, the Grand Duke raged and stormed, and sent for Jacob to cut off his head. But he was nowhere to be found, and the prince said he thought that the Grand Duke had hidden him so that no one would rob him of his best cook, and he accused the Duke of breaking his word. Soon war was declared between the two princes, well known as the Herb War, and many battles were fought, but peace was made at last, and this was known as the Pastry Peace.
for at the banquet the prince's cook served the celebrated suzerain pastry so that the grand duke should taste it in all its perfection. So now you can see that small beginnings can have great endings. And that is all there is to tell about the dwarf nose.